tonight we'll, we'll be leaving off of Genesis here for a few weeks as we go a few different places uh, around Easter time. But tonight we're looking at Joseph's instruction for the land. Last week, we, or two weeks ago, before the missionary, we had his interpretation for the king. Tonight we're going to have Joseph's instructions for the land in Genesis 41, 33 to 57. And I think we all know where this is going, that, that just last week... Joseph was plucked out of prison, and today he is going to be set on high in, in the, uh, the spot next to Pharaoh. And I don't think there's any comparable in the annals of history, just complete turnaround. I mean, there's men been in prison. prison. Nelson Mandela comes as an example, was, was a political prisoner, and, and eventually uh, ascended to the presidency, but there was some time there. Um, in the early 1900s in this country, a man named Eugene B. Debs, he was a union leader. He was in prison and got hundreds of thousands of votes for president, but he was far off from winning. But, but Joseph was literally in prison and is going to become prime minister of Egypt. So let's turn together to Genesis 41, and we'll pick some verses here starting in verse 33. And if you would stand with me for the reading of God's word. Genesis 41, 33. Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. Let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities, that the food shall be in store of the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this man, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And we'll stop there. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the example of Joseph and the testimony for you he was. And pray that we would be the same, Lord, being faithful in little things, that we might be faithful in much, and, and, and others might see your spirit working through us. Please guide my words in this time. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So here we have Joseph going from an interpreter, interpreting the dream to an instructor, what needs to happen, from an assessor of the situation to an actor. After years of preparation, he is raised to the height of power, and he is called upon to save a nation and really save much of the known world. We see here tonight God in control, blessing his faithful servant, and really setting the stage for the remarkable story that's going to come through the rest of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus. So we're going to see tonight the advice the appointment, and the alleviation. The advice is in verses 33 to 37. So Joseph has just finished interpreting Pharaoh's dream. And remember, that is all he was called upon to do. And that's all the wise men would have done. That just, Pharaoh, here's what your dream means and do with it what you will. But Joseph goes beyond here. He, he says, that's what the dream means and here's what you need to do in light of it. Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. He tells Pharaoh how to respond. He switches from what will happen, the prophecy of the dream, to what should happen and as a result, from the future to the present, from potential to actual. He says, Pharaoh, I've told you what's going to happen. There's going to be seven years of unimaginable famine, but we can get through this, God says. But in order to get things done, we need one person in charge. One person who knows what to do. Uh, they are discreet. That means they can perceive and understand a situation. And they have wisdom. They are wise of how to act. This man was going to give power by Pharaoh and operate under Pharaoh to administer, if you will, the disaster relief operation. Both the preparation and, and the, uh, the activity of that. So Pharaoh, you need to find the right man to help the nation through this time. And then he gives the plan itself. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years and let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let him keep food in the cities. So you need this one man to be in charge. And I think we've 
all been on committees where you could see the wisdom of having one man making decisions. But there's one man that's going to make decisions, but then there's going to be a, a whole staff of, of administrators that they are going to carry this out all over Egypt. They're going to carry out the task under this man's direction. And they are going to levy a one-fifth tax on all the grain produced in the land of Egypt. And they're going to take 20% of the produce of the whole nation. This is, a, if you will, a double tithe. Now, tithing was not unique to the people of Israel. Tithing was well known. We see long before the law, Abraham tithed just as if that was a natural thing. So people, tithing was not uncommon, but now a double tithe, 20%. And that may seem like a lot, but we see from the abundance that, that this, this 20%, the, the people still had plenty. They had more than enough to eat. They had more than enough to sell. This, this was just kind of off the gravy of all that the land had brought forth. And even two weeks ago, some of us were talking in the foyer, one-fifth, well, why that? Well, God knew what he was doing. And what the one-fifth tells us is the almost unimaginable bounty of the seven good years, that one-fifth of that crop was enough and more to, to feed during a basically zero crop year. Now, Egypt was not subsistence farming at this point. They were the, the luscious land in the world because of the, both the irrigation of the Nile and the, the fertilizer-rich sediment that would be deposited. So it was likely that the average person, that they, Egypt probably had double the grain they needed in a normal year, that they were really the breadbasket of the ancient world. But then an abundant year, so they have two or three times that normal double, so we can see that one-fifth of that is more than enough to feed the nation for a year, and, and it's going to be enough that they can sell to other people as well. So the plan was they're going to take this fifth, and the officials would store grain under Pharaoh's authority. The grain now belongs to Pharaoh, the embodiment of the nation. And it'll be kept, and note here, near the city stored up in preparation for the need. The, the grain is going to be stored through the seven years of plenty. It talks about it being guarded. They're going to be keeping an eye on this grain. They're going to have it, and actually even today, there are some of the granary structures of Joseph that's what they've been identified as in the land of Egypt. They were uh, mud brick. They were fashioned, keep all moisture off. They were fashioned to be very well ventilated. The, the, they, they could dry the grain and then B, to keep it dry. They could keep the insects out. And, and the Egyptian climate helps that. I mean, it's basically in Egypt, it's a really fine line that you're green where everybody lives and you can just look at the other side of the road and it's the desert. So they were really just off the green patch in the desert, which really helped the storage. And um, in England, there's a there's a, a study that's been going on for over 100 years of how long can grain keep. And they've actually put grain in a breathable container and, and it still germinates 100 years later. So this grain being kept for seven years was no problem. And actually these structures were double-ended. So it wasn't like you rammed some in the, in the beginning and then at the end and then you had to work back through that. It was whatever was put in first was the first out. So it was stored for seven years. It was all very, very keen and ingenious. But we needed a man to be in charge of that. And, and just think, people three, 3,500 years ago, they weren't that much different than us. Nobody likes a tax increase. So to levy a 20% tax on the whole nation's grain, that's why this man was so important. This would be highly unpopular. So A, you needed a guy that was going to be diplomatic. You needed a guy that was going to be able to, to explain this, was going to be able to sell this to the people, to, to show them the need. But also, 20% of the whole country's revenue, if you will, under the hand of one man, this needed to be a man beyond suspicion, a man totally trustworthy. So this is the type of man that Joseph recommends. He needs to be beyond reproach. Why they're gathering the grain, in verse 36, and that the food shall be in store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. This grain supply will grow, it'll be safeguarded through the good seven years, and it will be their national reserve. It, we still have things like that today. We have the National Oil Reserve, th things like that. We have Fort Knox, a gold bullion reserve. Well, this was going to be their grain reserve through these seven years. And when the famine comes, notice that's seven years in the future, but there is no question about it because God has said so. When this famine comes, 
It will assuredly come to the land, then we will have food. The reserve will see that the people, the people and the famine don't collapse. And that was not uncommon in this day and age. There wasn't large nations that could withstand this sort of thing. City-states, they would basically cease to exist if a famine like this hit. They just, everybody starved. So this was going to keep the nation of, Israel, of Egypt on the map. And Egypt, to world history, is a miracle. To, to be that power, and they have certainly lost influence, but to remain as a distinct nation basically throughout the history of the world is miraculous. And, and we're not going to go there, but the prophets tell us that to the end of, of time, Egypt is going to continue. They are not going to be wiped out. So God was protecting Egypt through his purposes here. Verse 37. So, so, hey, just think a minute. We just hauled this guy out of prison to interpret a dream, and then he presumes to tell Pharaoh what they ought to be doing. He's going to dictate national policy. Verse 37. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. Pharaoh wasn't dumb. Pharaoh sees the wisdom of the plan. He, Pharaoh was shook up after those dreams. So he was, he was open to suggestions. So he sees the wisdom, it's pleasing, it's reasonable to him, and it seems all those, all, remember, all the wise men had been gathered to interpret Pharaoh's dream, even though they were unsuccessful. So basically the, the whole of all the leaders of Egypt were gathered there, and they believe the interpretation, and they respect the suggestion too. Everybody's on board. And I can't help but think some of those wise men standing around are thinking, oh, that's a great idea, and who would be perfect for that? I, I think of Haman. In the book of Esther, when, when the king is, is saying, well, what, would I, what should I do for a man I want to honor? And Haman thinks, well, who would the king want to honor besides me? So I think there might have been a little bit amongst some of the wise men. But Joseph has just laid out the plan, and Pharaoh has accepted it. Joseph, if you will, this is Joseph's graduation day. He has spent years in God's training program preparing him for this moment. And he is soon going to be rewarded. Twelve years he spent. I know he, he was 17 around the time, but, but in that chapter there's a lot of things that happen until he gets down to Egypt. So maybe 18 by then. Twelve years, either a slave or in prison. But he was faithful. In the little things, he was faithful. And now God is going to put great things under his hand. How about you? When you are in, if you will, the training periods of life, when it seems that you're, you're on the shelf. It seems like nobody's watching. Are you being faithful? Are you putting in the effort for when God calls your number and brings you off the bench that you're ready to go? We see the appointment in verse 38 to 49. The advice is going to be followed, and there's one man that is suitable for the task. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. So Joseph had set the qualifications. You need a man that's discerning. You need a man that is wise. And Pharaoh looks around the room at, at all of his wise men, all of his servants. <clears throat> and in these qualities, there is none like this one man before him, Joseph. And the reason Joseph has them is they recognize the Spirit of God. We know the Holy Spirit comes upon people throughout the Old Testament for a specific task. And that is what he did here. The Holy Spirit came upon Joseph to enable him to interpret and make right recommendation for this dream. Pharaoh, pagan Pharaoh, he recognized the spirit of God was upon Joseph. Do people recognize the spirit of God in you? At work, whatever you're doing, do people recognize something different and by your testimony, do they attribute that to the spirit of God? Let's turn, if you would, with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, this is Paul exhorting and encouraging Timothy on what to do. First Timothy 6, 12, Paul instructs him, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art called, and hath professed a good profession 
before many witnesses. That's why I want to focus in on that last part. Have you professed a good profession before many witnesses? Not just your close friends that you feel safe with, not just your church brethren, but do you profess your profession of faith before many witnesses? Whatever good happens in your life, do you give praise to God? Do you let the Spirit work and then give Him glory when He does? Joseph did that. Joseph trusted God. Joseph, he wasn't lazy. He wasn't just sitting there saying, oh, God will take care of it. He labored, but he trusted God with the outcomes, even at the highest levels. We know Proverbs 21.1 says that the heart of the king is in the Lord's hand, and he turn it whithersoever he listeth. Do we trust God with things like that? Do we really trust God all the way from the smallest things in our life, the small inconvenience that we know God's not too busy and we send a quick prayer up to the, the national, international problems? Do we put it all before the Lord, trust Him that there's nothing too big or too small? God gave Joseph the interpretation of the dream. He gave Joseph the response. And Pharaoh is looking, if this man has that access, if God is going to reveal secrets to this man, it, it, no other human being could be as discerning or wise. Nobody else can compare. No, no doubt the other officials are jealous, but, but they can't measure up to Joseph with the Lord working through him. So Pharaoh says, you're going to be in charge of my household. Pharaoh was considered the father of Egypt. His household is the land. But notice the similarity in role. Joseph was over Potiphar's household. He was over the household of one man. Now he is over a king's household. He will have rule over the whole nation. When it says there, uh, all my people will be ruled according to thy word. And, and uh, the, the picture there is just the, the people will be subject to him. It, it says they will kiss you with their mouth. They will respect you. They will honor your words and what you command. That he will be second only to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is still in charge. But when it says only in the throne will I be greater than thee, it means Pharaoh basically says, I know my role. I'm going to be chief of the nation, but I'm not going to be looking over your shoulder on every decision. So Joseph, you report to me, but you go do what you've got to do. And nothing we see from Joseph indicates at all that he wanted this, that he suspected this was coming, but this was the role that God had prepared him for. He was probably surprised by Pharaoh's choice, but even in that moment, he doesn't waver. He trusts the Lord and is prepared to go. Verse 41 and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, Bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in the land of Egypt. So here we have Pharaoh officially and ceremonially investing Joseph in his new position, this authority. And this would have been the, the grand vizier. And this is a role still in, in Eastern governments. And it would have been akin to the prime minister. There's still the monarch, but he is the primary person carrying out the administrative function for the kingdom. He's going to uphold the power of the throne. And we see this position represented in, in Egyptian carvings and Egyptian writings. We see the Grand Vizier appointing officials, receiving ambassadors, managing assets, working on the infrastructure. And these are all going to be key and really make sense of what we see Joseph doing in coming chapters. So Pharaoh gives Joseph his own signet ring, the A, a symbol of his authority, and B, also part of, of enacting legislation. Once again, think of Esther. First, the, the king gave it to Haman, and he enacted laws, and then he gave it to Esther and Mordecai to enact their laws. So Pharaoh is saying, Joseph, don't come running to me every time you want to do something. You just go get it done. He gives him the robes and chains of authority put on immediately. An hour before, he was in prison rags. Now he is in the formal vesture of the prime minister. At every public appearance, Joseph is going to be just second to Pharaoh. He's going to have the second most ornate chariot. He's going to have people running before him saying, This man is important. Honor him. Bow before him. 
Nobody could do anything of significance without Joseph's approval. He, he really basically had dictatorial powers. But he was going to use them for the Lord. And that's, we have to watch that we don't read Scripture through our eyes. That, that's, that's very offensive to us, but throughout Scripture, and really throughout most of history, a, a good ruler, people didn't mind absolute authority because it was better than anarchy. So it, he was instituted by God, and he had the power, and he was going to use it for the Lord, and the people submitted to him. In our lives, we don't like to let anybody have that kind of authority over us. But are we willing to give that to God? Notice the people of Egypt, they didn't lift up hand or foot without Joseph's permission. And that's a hyperbole, but anything of significance, Joseph was consulted and approved. Is that how you live your life before God? Or do you say, I got the day-to-day -day stuff, God. If I got something big come up, I'll let you know. That's what he wants, that we don't lift up our hand or foot without putting it to him in prayer and, and receiving his guidance for it. But through all the land of Egypt, Joseph was going to rule from lowly to supreme. And this is another way we see Joseph as a type of Christ, from the, the, the baby born in a manger, from the, the man who didn't have a place to lay his head, to exalted on the right hand of the Father. And this is a picture of the, the kingdom. Remember, Christ says the last shall be first in the kingdom. And it's a reminder to us that, that all of our trials on this earth will be manifoldly repaid. The, these trials are, are but for a season. They're not even going to be something to be thought of when we are in eternity. We can trust that God has something even better than what he gave to Joseph. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Paneah, and he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out of the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Joseph has all this authority, but there's something very important he needs first. He needs to be a citizen of Egypt. And that's basically what this new name represents, is, is his citizenship to rep reflect his new people, his new role, his new authority. And the name... There's some debate on what it means. People say either a, a revealer of secrets or abundance of life. Any of these are very fitting for, for Joseph. Once again, they'd be very fitting for Christ as well, the knower of all things, the giver of life. But this is, this is a Coptic name. That's the ancient uh, Egyptian language. So Joseph is, A, he's got a new name. B, he's given something else. He is given a wife named Asenath, and that means belonging to Neith, the, the Egyptian deity. Her, her father was a priest, Potiphora, he who the sun gives. He's a priest of Ra, who, who was the sun god. And, and the city of On was about 10 miles north of the, the city of Cairo, where they likely were here. And this was a big deal, because the priests were, were the highest order in Egyptian society. The, the pharaoh, he was a civil and religious leader, so he was kind of a priest king, but even he didn't have full authority over some of the priests. They were top dogs in Egypt. So to be given to a, a priest's daughter to marry, this is, this is a sign of authority and, and Pharaoh's praise to Joseph. And, and we may recoil at that, that all this, this Gentile uh, pagan woman, but from everything we see, it seems likely that she and her sons believed in Elohim, the one true God. And, and Joseph, in his faithful testimony, shared this with them. God saved her out of pagan priesthood. God can save anybody. Nobody's too far gone. Nobody's beyond God's reach. If they will heed his word, they can be saved. She, it seems, made a perfectly suitable mate to Joseph. Joseph got a Gentile wife. Moses, in future generations, he was going to have a Gentile wife. And this is a, a touching picture, I think, and speaks that Yes, God in this time is focusing on the nation of Israel, but he didn't forget about the rest of the world. At, even at that time, he could save Gentiles, and the time was coming when he would have a much greater focus on them. But, but the greatest picture of Gentile salvation is Christ's Gentile bride, the church, mostly made up of Gentiles. Again, Joseph is a picture of Christ. But Joseph is now 30 years old, over 12 years of slavery, prison. And yes... That was pretty young to be the grand vizier, but he was prepared by God for this role, and he was ready to do it. 
So now he, he, is, he is fully ready to go. He, he stands before Pharaoh, literally standing there after his miraculous elevation, but, but figuratively standing before Pharaoh. He's in his job. He's ruling for Pharaoh, and it says twice he goes out, he gets to work. He goes out over all the land of Egypt to do what needs to be done. And he does it. Verse 47. <clears throat> And in the seven plentieth years, the earth brought forth by handfuls, and he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up food in the cities, and food of every field which was round about every city, laid he up the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea, very much until he left numbering, for it was without number. And it's easy for us to just assume how things happen, but notice how everything is just to the letter exactly how the dreams predicted. Everything God wills, he brings to pass. The next year, the very next year in the six that followed, the produce of the lands was by handfuls in abundance. It's high, uniform yields. All that could be asked for. And as he advised, Joseph faithfully took the one-fifth levy impartially from all the land. Nobody got overtaxed. Nobody slipped by the system. Joseph administered fairly, fairly. And he has all this worked out. Notice they're not hauling grain to Timbuktu. In every city, in every field, the the local fields they bring to one center. And and that center of of repository of grain was right by the city where it was going to be needed. The piles of grain grew and grew. More structures were built. And, And all these officials were trying to keep track. And it was just so much that they couldn't even count. And... And... I've been in the Midwest, some of the grain setups, they have literally millions of bushels of grain. It just blows your mind. But here they are hauling this and counting this grain by hand. And finally it says it's the sand of the seashore. It's without count. And Joseph knows that God has provided enough. This was God's plan, so so he doesn't even need to be accounting anymore. He knows that God has laid up enough to get them through. Friend, God doesn't bless half-heartedly. God doesn't give just a little bit. God is, gives abundantly, innumerably, immeasurably. So Joseph is ready for these seven years. And third, we see the alleviation when the famine finally comes. Verses 50 to 57. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh, for God, he said, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. In the seven years of plenty, before God alleviates the needs of Egypt, he alleviates the sorrow of Joseph. Asenath and Joseph had two sons. And it's just interesting reminder that his wife was this high-ranking woman. She was a big deal. He has these two sons, Manasseh, making to forget it means. that He basically forgets these 12 years of hardship in Egypt. They they count as nothing to him. He he gets his eyes off his past trials and he looks on to what God has for him. And that's what we are called to do. How often does something stick in our crawl and we just can't help. It doesn't matter how long ago it's been. It doesn't matter how the Lord is blessed since we never get over that hardship he put us through. That's not what he has for us. He wants to look onto the blessing he gives and praise him for it. Let's look at a couple New Testament references here. First, Romans 8, 18. Romans 8, 18. Here Paul says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now we know something of the suffering Paul went through. And this this is before imprisonment. He talks about being whipped, beaten, shipwrecked. All these things. And he says, that's not even a blip on the radar in view of eternity. His view is so consumed with seeing the glory of Christ that his trials count for nothing. That should be us. Yes, we, are, we should be learning through our trials, but once they are past, they, they should be as, as, as a dream when the morning comes. They're, they're of no importance compared to the blessing God gives. Let's turn back to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 
2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. And it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. We shouldn't expect to go under the name Christian and not suffer like Christ suffered. He was the leader in suffering. He went to the cross and our old nature should be crucified with him. But just as he, and we talked about this this morning, he is glorified on the right hand of the Father and all who have trusted him for salvation. We will be glorified. It says we will be on his throne with him. What right have we to complain? What have we gone through that can even be held, hold a candle to that? Joseph, notice he's not lifted up with pride here. He still gives God praise for all that has come to him. Uh, that's Ephraim or Ephraim. It means double fruit. God has blessed and made him fruitful in the land of his hardships, in the land of Egypt. So he is being fruitful for the Lord. Jacob here, he received a, both a personal blessing in his marriage and children and a professional blessing in his elevation after he was sent to Egypt as a slave. All that's passed, and he has been blessed of the Lord. This was in the seven good years, and Joseph's problems were alleviated, but now the land needs help. Verse 53, And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. And the seven years of dearth began to come according as Joseph had said, and the dearth was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. These seven years of great abundance come to an end. And I'm sure as they came year after year, it would have been just easy to think, well, this is how it has to be. I mean, they, they just couldn't even imagine anything different. This just abundance again and again and again. But then seven years of dearth, of drought resulting in great famine come immediately after. And it's a reminder that any physical blessing can end. It is so tempting to, to build. And, and we are called to make provision for ourselves and our children financially. But it's so easy to trust that. To realize that can be gone and will be gone in a moment. We need spiritual care. To not just assume good things happen. Remember, we looked when Joseph was in prison, God gave him grace in the eyes of the, the jailer. We don't deserve any good things. It's so easy for us to think, man, we, I, I, I deserve this. And, and I know how farmers are. And in dealing in my old job with farmers, if you have a good year but it wasn't as good as the year before. Well, we're all upset I didn't make as much money this year. And we're all that way in our spheres of life. Friend, we don't deserve anything. Every gift we have is by the mercies of God, and they should be counted as a gift and counted as a blessing, and he should be praised for it. But the famine has come now. The famine in Egypt, and it goes beyond Egypt to, to the, basically the known world to that point. The whole Middle East is in famine. But the bright spot here is there is bread in Egypt. Egypt, because they had noticed. None of the rest of the world, they all thought this was going to be a gravy train, continue forever. But Egypt knew the famine was coming by God's grace, and they prepared for it. And, and I think it's beyond just Joseph storing up. I think the Egyptians were told, famine is going to come, you need to be storing up. And so I think bread in the land of Egypt, it's not just what Joseph stored. The people had bread for themselves for at least a period of time. And it says, verse 55, when the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. And, and I think this isn't necessarily right at the beginning of the famine. People, they had enough. Maybe they could get through a year, but eventually all their stores ran out. And, and then they were bereft. They had nothing. So, so they, they began to be hungry. So they call on Pharaoh. He is their political leader. He is their religious leader. He is the one that is responsible for their well-being. So they cry unto him. And although they had the, right, the wrong focus, they had the right idea to call to one more powerful than them. That needs to be us. When, when our whatever needs they are, cry unto God, the only one who can meet our needs. But Pharaoh says, I've given all this to Joseph's hand. Go, he tells all the people, it's not you poor people, go talk to Joseph. If you're high enough, then you get an audience of Pharaoh. Everybody, go see Joseph, seek your provision from him, and obey. And the famine 
was all over the face of the earth, and Joseph opened the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians, and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because the famine was so sore in all the lands. Notice that Joseph didn't open the storehouses right away. It's not, okay, seven good years are over, let's, let's open them up here. He didn't open the storehouses until there was a need. And notice, people buy the corn. This has been abundance. People have made buku money and should have been saving it. And now he, he lets them keep their dignity in buying this grain back. The people basically had paid their taxes in the grain. And they, they worked to earn food. And now the food is sold reasonably and equitably to them. And Egypt is the only place in all the known world then with grain because they had the foreknowledge. And B, Egypt was the only place with the infrastructure for something like this. City states, they might have been able to gather a little grain, but Egypt was the only place. That's why God worked here. That's why God sent Joseph to Egypt. This was the only place where all of this could have come to pass. And all the nations come and buy. They come and buy once there's a need. And we need to remember that as well. That, that God has all provision we could need. But how often do we ask God a question that he's already answered for us? How often do we pray God, for God to handle something that he has already enabled us, he has gifted us, and we have the spirit, and we want God, God to handle it because we don't want to deal with it. God is there for our needs, but we are called to serve and be obedient and, and do the things that he has placed in our power, what he has enabled. But here, we end this chapter, the, the time of trouble is upon all the earth, but Egypt was told ahead and they were prepared there's another time of great trouble coming to all the earth. The tribulation is coming, but we're told about that too. We are to be prepared. And how do we prepare for that? It's not sitting in our armchair knowing we're going to get raptured out. It's the call to bring them in, to bring people to a saving knowledge of Christ and, and being about the Father's business until he comes. So we have seen the advice the advice that God gave to Joseph to give to Pharaoh, and it was heeded. We've seen the, the appointment of Joseph to this elevated position, and we've seen the alleviation of his personal sorrows and the famine in the land. I don't think anything, any of us have gone through trials like Joseph has. I, I don't know where you're going, what you're going through, but whatever it is, God can reward you infinitely more. But you need to be ready for it. Like Joseph you need to, when the trial is going on or when it feels like you're kind of on the back burner, burner, be faithful. Be humble. Be ready when the Lord calls you either to service or whatever it is. We need to remember to not put our trust in physical things. All the money in the world can disappear. We need to trust the Lord. We need to let the Spirit work in our lives just as Joseph did. And we need to let others see that. So friend, I ask tonight, whether you feel like you're hidden in the prisons, or whether you feel like you're on the, the world stage and people are looking to you, are you being faithful and humble and ready with whatever God's call is in your life? As he gives you the wisdom, as he gives you provision, do you treat it as the gift that it is? And thank him for it and praise the Holy Spirit and you let others know that it's all of God and it's the Spirit's working in your life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love and care to us. We thank you that nothing is beyond your power. We thank you that you love us, Lord, and, and desire to help us. Heavenly Father, help us not to be prideful and to just expect things. Help us to treat everything as a gift from you. Lord, when we're in the trial, help us to, to just be prepared for whatever you're calling us to, and we're in the time of blessing. Help us to give you the praise and honor, and help us to let other knows that others know it's all of the Spirit, Lord. Help us to get our eyes off whatever we can do, and on to what you have done and your blessing for us, Lord. We love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, put an area of your life where maybe you need to give him the praise, you need to be thankful, or you just need to be ready to serve. The altar's open as Doug leads us in our closing. Closing song is number 482.
please stand as we sing 482, Where He Leads Me. <laughs> 